Okay, good. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last talk in the um, series for the year. So, uh, yeah, just a short bit of housekeeping. So, last talk for the year, but we will resume again on February 10th, but we will send some more information about that um, closer to the date. Uh, anyway, so I'm very happy that we have Ernest Rue today um, from Seoul National University. Uh, he has bachelor degrees in physics and electrical engineering from Caltech. Um, he did a, a master's and a PhD at Stanford with Stephen Boyd, uh, where he looked at uh, convex optimization for Monte Carlo methods. Um, he then moved to UCLA, where he worked with Italian, and I think some of the stuff that he'll talk about today is from that time. And then, yeah, as he said earlier, he moved um, in March to his assistant professor job at uh, Seoul National University. So, yeah, today he's going to tell us about uh, a new approach to non-expensive operators, which he calls the scaled relative graph. So, Ernest, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for the kind intro introduction, uh, Matt, and uh, thank you everybody for coming to my talk uh, today. So today I'll, I want to talk about uh, the, the, the scaled relative graph, um, and this is work uh, done uh, with Robert Hanna and Wotelian while I was there as a, uh, as a, as a postdoc. So um, the motivation is that, um, so, fix, so this is a, uh, a crowd with a very strong background in, uh, in variational analysis and uh, uh, monotone operator theory. And we all know that uh, most of the papers that we write are based on uh, inequalities. Uh, it's the, these are mostly uh, analytical uh, proofs that we perform. Um, so fixed point iterations are very commonly used in, in many branches of, of applied mathematics, but in particular, uh, for, for my specific interests, I'm interested in splitting methods like ADMM, uh, Douglas Rackford splitting, um, um, the Shembol Pock method, PDHG, these things um, are all fixed point iterations. And uh, their convergence is usually established, uh, their convergence proof is established, established usually uh, analytically with uh, inequalities. And, um, um, and I, will, I, I will say uh, that these proofs uh, can be unintuitive. So um, I, I've produced these proofs before, I, I, uh, before, so I understand that when you write these proofs, um, you, you, you study the system for a long time, you look at all the terms, and after a while, all of the, all of the inequalities, all the terms um, do um, 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 come, do uh, come alive in the sense that all the terms, they, they have meaning. The proofs are, are, are not um, soulless, the proof has a soul. But um, once you understand everything and then carefully choose the terms and write down the proof, once the, paper, once the proof is written on a paper and, and presented to, to another person in print, it's not always easy to communicate the core intuition, the core insight of the proof. Often these proofs are, although some, some, uh, some are tedious, uh, straightforward, to anal, uh, straightforward to verify, but the understanding it can be unintuitive, at least for those readers who don't spend uh, a lot of time trying to uh, 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 redo lots of the, uh, many parts of the proof and also redo the proofs under sort of slightly different uh, settings. So in this work, uh, we introduce an alternate uh, geometric approach ra rather than analytical, we introduce a geometric approach uh, based on two-dimensional Euclidean geometry. And uh, this geometric approach allows us to um, um, perform geometric proofs that are uh, more visual and because they are more, more visual, I claim that they are more intuitive. And this talk is based on uh, the paper entitled, with the same title as, as the talk. So to give you an, a rough idea of what kind of results that I, well, we will be working towards, let me give you a sample result. So let's assume we have a, a function f that is uh, strongly convex and smooth and we perform the most standard minimization optimization algorithm, gradient descent. Now, this method converges exponentially or, or converges linearly to the solution with uh, this rate. Now, how do we prove this? Well, there, are, uh, there exists several proofs. Um, actually, this pr result was only formally proved in 2015, so that's a, somewhat of a long story to explain when, exact, when this ex exact result was proved. But in any case, um, there exist proofs that are based on inequalities, more standard looking proofs, but we can do something like this. So this circle um, 
represents the action of the, of the gradient operator where the function is strongly convex and L smooth. It's this circle. And then this translated and scaled circle represents the action of identity minus, uh, minus uh, alpha grad F. So this is the gradient descent operator. The gradient descent iteration is a fixed point iteration with respect to this operator. And its action is represented by uh, this uh, darker circle. And this darker circle um, is a subset of this larger circle. This larger circle uh, is centered at the origin and its radius is made as small as possible uh, while containing it, uh, the, the, this darker circle. And this lighter, this lighter circle has radius equal to this. Now, at this point, um, I haven't really rigorously explained what this means, what these circles mean. So this is at what I described is at best an illustration and certainly not yet a, a rigorous proof. But uh, through the machinery of the scaled relative graphs, we will make these, uh, these uh, geometric arguments into actual rigorous proofs of convergence. Okay. All right, now let me ex explain some of, the, some of the background. So this, uh, these slides, uh, these few slides might be obvious to uh, this uh, variational analysis uh, crowd, but I'll just, uh, exp I'll still explain them uh, for the sake of um, establishing the notation, uh, if not anything else. Okay, so um, here's, here are two steps of using a fixed point iteration. First, uh, in, in, uh, as far as I know, uh, not that many problems are naturally posed as fixed point problems. Usually we need to find an operator such that a fixed point corresponds to the solution of the problem at hand. So from an engineering perspective, you might have an optimization problem, but you perform a little bit of you know, transformations um, using gradients and maybe resolvents to, po to, to, to find a fixed point, a fixed point encoding so that if you find a fixed point to the fixed point problem, then you get a solution to the optimization problem. So you perform some transformation to obtain a fixed point problem. And then given that now that you have this operator T, we perform the fixed point iteration. Now an engineer might just uh, perform step number two and hope the method converges and that could be fine. Uh, but for mathematicians, for us mathematicians, we want to be able to prove uh, that this uh, fixed point iteration would converge. So here are, some, uh, here are the standard, that standard approaches to establishing convergence of the fixed point iteration. So we say the operator is non-expansive if it is one Lipschitz continuous. And fixed point iterations with non-expansive operators, they don't have to converge. The most uh, simple example is the operator T that flips the sign of the input. This, a fixed point iteration with respect to this operator, this is a non-expansive operator, but the fixed point iteration with respect to this operator um, doesn't converge. Now then the most commonly known, widely, widely known condition for establishing convergence of a fixed point iteration is the contraction. So we say the operator is a contraction if it's, one Lipsch, if it's L Lipschitz continuous with Lipschitz continuity coefficient strictly less than one. And if the operator is contractive, then the uh, iterates, iterates converge to the, to the solution strongly in the infinite dimensional setup. And uh, we, we even have, a, have the rate the rate is given by L to the power K, where K is the number of iterations. And this is the, uh, this is the, uh, the, the, the famous Banach contraction principle. Now in the optimization world, in the variational analysis world, we are, we are more familiar with, uh, we're also familiar with one more uh, setup and that's the average, the KM iteration. So we say an operator T is averaged if the operator T can be written as, well, an averaging, a convex combination between the identity mapping and some other non-expansive operator. If, T, if the operator T is averaged and if it has a fixed point, so this has to be assumed, it, it's not a given. Uh, um, if, if the operator is averaged and if there's a fixed point, then the iterates converge to a solution uh, weakly uh, for some, some fixed point. And this result, uh, this convergence result is known as the Krasnoselsky man, the KM iteration. So here's a, now we have a general rubric for proving convergence of a fixed point iteration. In step number one, we prove that the operator uh, T, which is the operator that we're performing the fixed point iteration with, is a contractive operator or, or, or an average operator. And then we appeal to the argument of Banach or Krasnoselsky-Mann 
to uh, obtain conversions. Now this step two is a routine step. I, I laid out the convergence results and we can just cite that. So, uh, it, and so usually the difficult part is in establishing, uh, is in the first step. This first step is usually the harder part. And uh, we therefore, so in this work, we present a geometric approach for performing uh, step number one. By the way, here uh, we have some illustrations. So this is an illustration of the non-expansive operator, which is um, a weaker condition uh, compared to averaged operators. So the, the set of average operators are contained in, in, in non-expansive operators and contractive operators uh, are a subset of averaged operators as you, as you can see from these shapes, uh, which is in, in, in turn a subset of non-expansiveness. So and the assumption of averageness, average, averageness is a weaker assumption than contractiveness, but it's a stronger assumption than non-expansiveness. And I'll explain by the end of, this, end of, end of the talk, uh, I think you'll, uh, it'll, it'll be clear what these uh, circles uh, are referring to precisely. Okay, now let me introduce the notion of the scaled relative graph. So let's consider a, a nonlinear and possibly multi-valued operator A. And I, I think in, in this seminar, I don't have to apologize for using multi-valued operators. So we'll pick uh, X and Y as two distinct inputs. And we'll pick, oh, this, okay, sorry. This, this slide was actually modified. Okay, I forgot to rechange this. Okay, I'm going to use the set notation. So it's going to be um, U is an output of the operator A and V is an output uh, of the operator A at point Y. So uh, U is an output at X, V is an output at Y. Um, then we will consider the complex conjugate pair given by this. So this Z is a complex number. Z is a complex number and it is expressed in polar form. This part is the magnitude of the complex number. And here, here we have an exponent of plus minus I and this, is the, uh, and this uh, denotes the angle between the vectors U minus V and X minus Y. Um, when, so when u minus v and x minus y are non-zero vectors, and by the way, x minus y is assumed to be non-zero. So when uh, u minus v is equal to zero, then the angle is undefined. So we just let the angle of value be equal to zero. Otherwise, the angle is defined by taking the inner product um, and dividing by the norms and applying the arc cosine. Okay, and, and z, this z is not a single complex number. It's a complex conjugate pair. We have plus minus, and that's because the angle operator defined with arc cosine only outputs a positive angles. It outputs angles between zero and pi, zero be between zero and 180 degrees. There's a sign ambiguity. So in order to remove the sign ambiguity, we have a plus minus I. The real and imaginary components of the, the, the complex number Z, um, they, respect, they represent the components of U minus V aligned with the component uh, aligned with x minus y uh, and perpendicular to x minus y. So the real part of z um, corresponds to, uh, we take a u minus v, the, out, the difference of the outputs, and we project it onto the span of the inputs and we take the norm of that. So this is the component of the outputs that's proportional, that's, uh, 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 that's uh, aligned with the difference of the inputs x minus y. In contrast, the imaginary component of z corresponds to the difference of the outputs, u minus v, um, that's uh, the components of that, that's perpendicular to the difference of the inputs, x minus y. Now, uh, now, with this, uh, th now, now that we've talked about this z, we define the scaled relative graph of this operator uh, in this way. So uh, the scaled relative graph of the operator A is the set of all of these z's that we can construct with distinct inputs x and y and uh, outputs um, u and v uh, within the multivalued operator ax and ay. And furthermore, we, uh, we add the point of infinity to the scaled relative graph if z is multivalued. So uh, the scalar relative graph of a is in a set of complex numbers uh, with, uh, with the point of infinity added in, which is the extended uh, complex plane. And one interpretation 
that I, I think it's helpful. This is I think this is a helpful interpretation. We can view the SRG, uh, the the relationship of the SRG to a nonlinear operator, to be something similar to something akin to the, the relationship between eigenvalues of a, to a matrix. Um, the eigenvalues of a matrix does not capture everything about the, the matrix, but it captures a lot of information. The eigenvalues of a matrix tells us a lot about the action of a given matrix. In, in, likewise, the SRG tells us a lot about the action what, of, of a nonlinear multivalued operator. It doesn't tell us everything about what the operator does, but it tells us a lot about what the operator does. So here are some examples of the scaled relative graph. Um, as our first example, this a PL is, is, a, is a projection onto, a of a, on, onto some line in the space R2. If we draw the SRG, it becomes uh, this uh, ring. Um, next, we have uh, this linear operator, which, uh, is, which is characterized by this diagonal matrix with uh, diagonals one, two, and three. If we draw its SRG, it becomes uh, this shape. So within this big circle, these small circles are excluded. Um, this is the subdifferential operator of the Euclidean norm in space Rn, where n is bigger than two. So this is a um, the, the the Euclidean norm without the square is a non-differentiable convex function. So we know that this is a monotone operator. It's a multi-valued monotone operator, and its SRG looks like this. So the or origin is included, but otherwise the uh, y-axis, the vertical axis, is excluded, and everything to the right of the y-axis is included and also the point of infinity is included. The point of infinity is included because this is a multi-valued operator at the origin. So here's one, <clears throat> one uh, in my opinion, interesting result. It, th this result, we don't actually, I'm not actually going to use this result, but I think it's interesting, so I'm going to point it out. For matrices, the SRG generalizes eigenvalues. So if we have an n by n matrix, and we assume that the n is not equal to two, then the set of uh, eigenvalues, so the, the spectrum of A, the set of eigenvalues is contained in the SRG. And here's an illustration. So we, we, we take a look at this matrix. Uh, this, is, um, this matrix has, if you do the computation, it has eigenvalues equal to two, um, one half plus i and one half minus i, it has three eigenvalues. And its SRG uh, is, well, this uh, interesting shape, and as you can see, it, it contains the eigenvalues. By the way, the form of the SRG, the, 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 the definition and the equations uh, that go into the definition of the SRG um, bear some similarity with the definitions of, definition of, of the numerical range, which is also called the field of values in linear algebra. And the notion also seems to be somewhat uh, similar to, uh, it feels similar to the notion of the pseudo spectrum. But uh, as far as I can tell, uh, despite these similarities, there, do, there doesn't seem to be a direct relevance. It, they, they don't seem to be directly related. So they, they seem to be uh, a, a distinct notion. By the way, the proof of this result uh, fails for uh, n equals two because the proof actually relies on a certain uh, a, a topological argument where we construct a, a loop and then we contract the loop to, uh, to a single point. And uh, the sphere in Rn is simply connected for n bigger than two, but it's not simply connected because the, the sphere in R2 is, 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 is the ring and the ring is not simply connected. <clears throat> uh, characterizing the SRG exactly for uh, matrices is even, even, even just for matrices is not uh, that easy. But for normal matrices, we can characterize uh, the, the, the exact shape of the, uh, of the SRG. So um, if we have a normal matrix, by the way, the definition of a normal matrix is, um, so ATA is equal to AAT, that's the definition of a normal matrix. If we have a normal matrix, then we can exactly characterize the SRG. And it looks something like this. So on the left, we have a, um, a, a normal matrix with eigen, the SRG of a normal matrix with seven distinct eigenvalues. You can see that this is a, uh, this is a real eigenvalue and these all, everything else are uh, uh, complex conjugate uh, pair eigenvalues. And on the right, we have uh, an SRG of a normal matrix with uh, six distinct eigenvalues. Um, and these are all real. So because the eigenvalues are real, we can infer that the matrix has to be symmetric. Um, in any case, uh, the precise characterization 
um, relies on um, an idea from hyperbolic geometry. And it's actually given, uh, this is actually, if you're familiar with the Poincaré half plane model, you'll recognize that, oh, that's, this is the exact same shape. So for some reason, for an interesting coincidence, uh, the, the, uh, the SRG of normal matrices are characterized with the Poincaré half plane model. To be precise, these are uh, straight lines in the Poincaré half plane model. Okay, so um, I defined what the SRG is for a single operator. And then I showed you some examples, some, some pictures of what SRGs of different operators can, can look like. But um, that, I, I did that just for the sake of illustration because what we really want to use is not the SRG of a single operator, but we, mo for the most part, want to use the, the SRG of operator classes. So um, A is an operator class, meaning A is a set of operators. And we define these, the SRG of an operator class uh, just by taking the union of the individual SRGs of the individual operators that belong to the class. The reason we focus on SRGs of operator classes rather than the SRG of individual operators is because most theorems are implicitly stated in terms of operator classes rather than individual operators. Because for example, um, a theorem or a lemma in a, in a textbook might say that the operator identity minus A is non-expansive if A is beta over two, uh, um, is uh, one over two co-coercive. Now, this, it, this uh, statement is, um, it's stated in terms of the individual operator A, but, but the operator A is, is actually a dummy variable here. Really, this is a statement about the operator class. What, the, what, what, what here this is saying is that if we, um, the action, the, the operation of taking the uh, identity minus the operator, and the result of that is not expansive if A is part of the, uh, the class of co-coercive, one, one over two co-coercive operators. So this is more a state, the, this result is more a statement about uh, a, a class of operators, the class, the operators that the co-coercive operators, and therefore we can view this, this, this kind of theorem as a theorem stated in terms of uh, operator classes rather than one individual operator. So therefore, now we characterize uh, the SRG of some operator classes. So um, this is the SRG of strongly monotone or just monotone uh, operator operators. As we can see, it's the right half plane, the closed right half plane shifted to the right by value mu. So if it's just monotone, uh, mu is equal to zero. And, and we also add in the point of infinity. This is the SRG of ellipsis continuous operators. So it's the circle centered at the origin with radius L. This is the, um, um, the, this is the SRG of uh, beta co-coercive operators. It's the circle um, touching the origin, uh, touching a one over beta. So its diameter is one over beta. And this is the SRG of theta averaged operators. So it's the circle touching one with radius theta. Oh, and also, uh, this is the SRG of the gradient of mu strongly convex differentiable functions. Um, and this is the SRG of, of the gradient of uh, one over beta Lipschitz uh, differentiable convex functions. Okay, so through these definitions, uh, um, we established a way, to, uh, the, the definitions establish, establishes a forward direction in the sense that if we provide an operator or an operator class, the definitions uh, define an SRG. And if we just plug in the definitions and perform some calculations, in some cases, we're able to precisely draw the SRG. But conversely, we need to be able to perform some sort of uh, converse reasoning in the sense that we want to be able to look at the SRG. We want to be able to look at these shapes, these two-dimensional shapes, and be able to sit, conclude something about the operator class. And in general, this is not actually possible. In general, it's not possible to merely look at the operator, uh, the SRG, and conclude something about the operator class. So in order to perf perform the reasoning of we look at the SRG and we conclude something about the operator class, we need some further conditions. And this further condition is called SRG of fullness. 
So we say a class of operators is SRG full if inclusion in the class is, in, is, in, is equivalent to uh, inclusion um, of the SRGs. So uh, to clarify, this is uh, the set inclusion. This means the operator A is included in the operator class A. And this is a, 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 a sub, this is the subset of as complex, as, as a subset of complex numbers. So this is a shape in the two dimensional plane, potentially including the point of infinity. This is also a shape in the two dimensional plane, potentially including the point of infinity. And this is uh, inclusion in the two dimensional plane. To put it differently, uh, an operator class is SRG full if membership of the operator class is equivalent to the containment of the SRG, and that means the SRG class is fully characterized by its SRG. By definition of the SRG, this forward uh, uh, implication uh, actually just holds immediately for all operator classes just by definition of the SRG. So really, this reverse implication is the substance of this definition. And I'll just quickly informally state that the important operator classes that we consider are all SRG full. So um, the, the class of monotone operator, the class of monotone operators, the class of L Lipschitz continuous operators, the class of average operators, these are these operator classes are all SRG full. Okay, so now that I've established the SRG. Um, machinery, uh, let me show you how to use them to prove uh, convergence results. So operator, um, so um, now, now that we've set up the uh, SRG machinery, we actually have uh, some very, in my opinion, elegant uh, results. So um, then these results may, uh, um, can be described as the operator transformation is like is similar to the SRG transformation. I, I, I'm not going to say homomorphism because to define a homomorphism, we need to define what the group is and exactly, but it kind of looks like that. So the algebraic operations on operators like addition, composition, uh, inversion, these correspond to geometric operations on the SRG and the 2D plane. So under suitable conditions, the SRG of the intersection of two classes is equal to the uh, intersection of the SRGs. Scaling the operator by alpha. This is taking the output. Of, this is scaling the output of the operator by uh, scalar alpha. Um, is equivalent to and, and taking the SRG is the same as taking the SRG and scaling the the set of complex numbers by value alpha. Adding identity to the SRG. Sorry, adding identity to the operator class and then taking the SRG is the same as adding taking the SRG and adding one, which means shifting the SRG to the right by one. Uh, inverting the operator and taking the SRG is taking is the equivalent as taking the SRG and perform and computing the uh, reciprocal of the complex numbers. This one of this uh, minus one. This is the reciprocal one over z of complex numbers. And the we have similar something similar with addition and also a composition. So this is composition of operators is the same and taking the SRG is the same as taking the individual SRGs and computing the Minkowski uh, product. Okay, so the, um, of those things that I had stated in the, in, as a list, um, this is a first result. So um, we scale the operator, we add identity, uh, and that's we can do the same in the, in the SRG space. So let's use this to prove conversions of the gradient descent method. Let me, I'll provide you with a rigorous proof of the initial illustration that I provided. So this is the same setup the function f is strongly convex and smooth, and will perform the uh, gradient descent method. And this method, our, my claim is that this method converges exponentially with this rate. Now let's provide the proof. So this uh, this fact, um, right, this fact is equivalent to saying that this uh, operator is R Lipschitz continuous. So this is the class of gradient descent operators uh, with uh, mu strongly convex and L smooth functions. This is the, uh, the, the function class of mu strongly convex L smooth. We take the gradient of that, we multiply by, by alpha, and we take identity minus this thing. So this is the class of gradient descent operators. And um, what we want to prove is that we want to prove that is a subset of R Lipschitz continuous operators where R is given by this value. 
And when that holds for every iteration, we have a contraction by this amount and we repeat that K times and we get the power K. So here's how we do this. Um, because LR, the Lipsch class of Lipschitz continuous operators is a SRG full class, because of SRG fullness, inclusion of the class is equivalent to the inclusion of the SRG. We draw the SRG of the gradient map, the gradient class, the class of gradient operators for mu, mu strongly convex L smooth functions. And then we perform the transformation. So we multiply by minus alpha, we add one, we get this SRG for the uh, SRG of the gradient uh, descent mappings. And we find the smallest circle centered at the origin and we find the radius R. And that radius R is given by uh, this, this formula. And we can see that this smaller circle is contained within this bigger circle. This bigger circle is the SRG of LR. So the, so the inclusion of the shape of the two-dimensional shapes uh, implies is equivalent to the inclusion uh, of the operator class. Therefore, we in, uh, therefore, from this inclusion, we conclude this, res, this inclusion, and that implies the convergence result. So uh, in this proof, I, uh, this, is, this, is, this is a talk, it's not, it's not a paper. So I did omit, I did uh, uh, go through some steps quickly, and also the theorems that I use, I didn't prove in this talk. Uh, but this proof is a completely rigorous proof. Uh, this, the, this argument is not a illustration. Uh, it's, a completely rig it's a completely rigorous proof based on uh, um, uh, two-dimensional two Euclidean geometry and also the SRG machinery. Uh, let me show you, uh, uh, so let's, uh, let me show you some, a few more results. So let's assume an operator A is, um, is, is now it's a monotone operator. It's mu strongly monotone and L Lipschitz and we consider uh, this forward step method. So it's basically like the gradient descent uh, method, except that instead of a gradient, uh, op op gradient operator, we have a monotone operator that's assumed to be strongly monotone and L Lipschitz. And this method converges exponentially, converges linearly to the solution with this particular rate. Now, where, the, where does this rate come from? Well, here, here it is. So we assumed the operator is strongly a monotone, which means the SRG should rely should reside should be within this region, and we also assumed that the SRG is L Lipschitz, so the SRG should be within this region. And so those are two assumptions. And since we had two assumptions, we take the intersection. When we take the intersection, we are left with uh, this uh, this uh, narrow uh, region for our, the SRG of our operator A. Um, then we multiply by alpha. Well, we multiply by minus one. We get uh, this region, and then uh, we add uh, identity, we add plus one, and we get this region. And then finally, we now that we have this shape and we have these points uh, 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 as, so this point, the val this point in the complex plane is one minus alpha L. This point is one minus alpha, uh, uh, alpha mu. And we find the, uh, the, the circle centered at the origin with the smallest radius while containing this uh, darker, region, uh, darker region. And once we find, draw the circle, as we have done here, we need to f compute this radius. And this radius can be computed with, some uh, with the use of the Pythagorean theorem. So we, we do that and we plug in the numbers and we get that the radius becomes this number. And um, I, I, I guess this is a bit interesting because, um, well, I, I found this, uh, really, um, this result really satisfying because um, when I first saw this particular rate, and I think I first saw, saw this rate in the Bausch Kumbet's uh, textbook, um, it wasn't, I, it, I had no idea where the square root was coming from. Where is the square root coming from? I had no idea. Of course, I went through the proof, I uh, followed the proof, and I guess I, in some sense, I understood the proof, but it didn't really, um, where the square root is coming from was not obvious to me at that time. But now that I draw this using the SRG, and now that I understand that this radius R is obtained by using the Pythagorean theorem, now I have a more satisfying answer. Uh, the, the square root uh, originates from the use of the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, um, now let's uh, now let me talk. Let's talk about inversion because 
Um, in splitting methods, we use operator inversion all the time, mo more, most spe specifically through the use of resolvents. So, um, so in, in order to deal with that, we need to understand what happens to the SRG when we perform uh, operator inversion. Let's define the inversion map on the extended complex plane. The inversion map take, takes the uh, complex number Z and maps it to uh, Z bar inverse, where Z bar is its complex conjugate. If we express the inversion map in polar form, then we have R times E to the I theta. So R is the uh, non-negative uh, uh, magnitude of the, of the complex number. Uh, phi is the uh, ar argument of the complex number. And it maps it to 1 over R times E to the I phi. In other words, the inversion map preserves the angle, uh, but inverts the magnitude. The inversion is a, uh, is a classical tool in Euclidean geometry. And uh, I'm using the word classical in a little bit of a um, um, uh, derogatory way. I'm, what I really mean is, is somewhat obscure. But in any case, it's a uh, classical tool, tool in Euclidean geometry. And by the way, this, uh, this uh, inversion map is also known in a more, slightly more general, general form as the Mobius transformation in complex analysis. Um, generalized circles, uh, the, 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 word, uh, the term generalized circles refer to uh, finite circles in the extended complex plane and lines with a, a infinity uh, added to it. And the idea is that generalized circles, um, um, uh, so the idea is that a line with point of infinity, with a point of infinity added in is like, uh, it, it's like a circle with infinite radius. Um, and if, um, yes, and the inversion map um, maps generalized circles to generalized circles. So here are some illustrations. So if we take uh, this disk and perform the, uh, apply the inversion map, we get uh, this region where this boundary is mapped to this boundary and this interior is mapped to this, this exterior. This region, when we, once we, when we apply inversive geometry, inversion map, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, gets mapped to this disk. And this half plane um, gets mapped to uh, this disk. And the point of, of infinity, by the way, is mapped to the origin. So, um, the, the, the inversive geometry is a, a somewhat, um, um, it may be unfamiliar to, to many. To many. Uh, it was certainly unfamiliar to, to myself when I was first uh, looking into the, the, this work, but um, it, gets, it, it takes a little bit of time to get used to, but it's not too complicated. But, um, but once, you under, once you get comfortable with inversive geometry, now it then becomes really helpful in understanding uh, operator inversion because if we invert an operator and take the SRG, and that's the same as taking the uh, SRG of the operator and computing the reciprocal as a complex number. And this reciprocal as a complex number corresponds to applying the inversion map. So let me show you an application of this. Um, let's assume that an operator A is uh, mu strongly monotone and beta co-coercive. And we'll assume that the operator B is just merely monotone. And let <clears throat> And let's consider um, this uh, fixed point iteration, which is the, the piecemeal rack for splitting. <clears throat> and this piecemeal rack for splitting converges exponentially to the fixed point with this specific rate. Now let's prove this rate. So first, um, we draw the SRG of I plus alpha uh, A, and A is assumed to be uh, strongly monotone. So again, this, is, this corresponds to the strong monotone assumption um, and it's also um, beta co-coercive. So um, this region corresponds to the beta co-coercivity assumption. And uh, we take, since we have two assumptions, we take the intersection and this region corresponds to the intersection. Uh, next, we, we perform the inversion. We, we put this through the inversion map and uh, this line gets mapped to this circle and this circle gets mapped to this circle. So we take the intersection and we get this lens shape. Um, then, um, so this is the resolvent. To get the reflected re resolvent, we, we perform the re reflection mapping. So this gets uh, magnified by a factor of two and it uh, goes to uh, this shape. We, we, we get this lens shape. And then we find the circle centered at the origin um, 
Uh, so this this elider circle is centered at the origin and uh, centered, at the, centered at the origin, and we find the uh, the radius of this circle. So in order to do so, we uh, draw this uh, this triangle. So um, so line segment OA is what we want to figure out, and um, um, uh, the point point B is the center of this dotted circle. Set point C is the center of this dotted circle, and O is the origin. So we know the diameter, we know the radius of, of circle B, we know the radius of, of, of circle C, uh, we know the, the length of the line segment BC. So, um, so based on those informations, we can use what's called the Stewart's theorem, which is, fu which is fundamentally derived, uh, uh, it's, it's a more, it's, it's, an inst it's, some, it's, it's something that can be derived using the Pythagorean theorem. So the Stewart's theorem um, is, uh, well, it, it, it has this scary form, but it's, it's a well-known theorem regarding the triangles of this form with the, with the, Chevian, uh, o, the Chevian line segment O and A. We plug in the numbers, these are the numbers, and simplify, and we get this result. And this is our contraction factor. Okay, so, um, so that's how we work with, um, that's how we work with uh, inversions. Um, now let's talk about uh, compositions of operators. So let's say um, A and B are SRG full classes, the, the nice classes. And let's assume uh, for the moment that the SRGs uh, don't contain um, zero or infinity. Yeah, so let's assume that the SRGs uh, don't contain infinity. Sorry, it, it, it can contain zero. Um, and we, we assume that the, op, the, the class A or B satisfies the left arc property or the right arc property. So the left arc, prop, arc property, uh, these arc property are, are properties are, I think, defined or, or they're explained most easily uh, with a picture. So let's say this is, let's say this is um, the, the SRG of some, some class. Well, the left arc property says that we pick any point Z within the SRG, and we, then, we, uh, then there's a corresponding complex conjugate Z bar, and then we find the left arc, and the left arc uh, is defined as the distance to the solution is maintained constant. So, so this distance is the same as this distance. So we draw this left arc. If this left arc is completely contained in the SRG, then this, then this class satisfies the left arc property. This is the right arc property, which states that we, within the SRG, we pick, pick a point Z, there's a corresponding complex conjugate Z bar, and we draw the right arc. And the right hand arc is defined as, well, we take these two points, we draw the circle um, with, uh, with the center at the origin and the, the segment between uh, the chord between the Z and Z bar, that's the right arc. And if that's completely contained in the SRG, then it satisfies the right arc property. If one of the operators satisfies one of these arc properties, there's the left and right, right arc property. If, the, if one of the operators satisfies one of the properties, then the composition of the SRGs, um, the, the, the SRG of the composition is the same as the SRGs multiplied as complex numbers. By the way, these are nonlinear and non-commutative operators. So uh, AB is not the same as BA, but the claim in the, the statement of this theorem states that even though AB is not the same as BA as operators, they share the same SRG. The SRGs commute even when the operators do not. Okay, so here's a, an application of, of this uh, 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 composition result. So um, if we have, uh, so this is, let's say we, uh, we have, we're given the problem of finding a point within the intersection of, of two uh, non-empty closed complex sets C and D. The most, uh, no, the most uh, simple method to perform it, to solving this problem is to perform alternating projections. So we project onto D, project onto C, and that's our fixed point iteration. Um, so P and C, the, the projections are firmly non-expansive. They are one half average operators. So we have a composition of two one half average operators. And now we want to know what's, what, what does the SRG of this composition looks like? Okay, so we write N one half as the, the class of firmly non-expansive operators. The SRG of, these, uh, of, of the composition of these two classes has uh, this specific shape. Uh, it has this specific, specific shape uh, defined by well, this formula. Um, 
And this shape is, by the way, it's known as uh, the, the, the cardioid. And uh, specifically, this shape belongs to the, the larger circle of n two thirds. So the composition of one half average of two one half average operators uh, uh, is a two thirds average operator. And a fixed point iteration with a two thirds average operator converges weakly to a solution by appealing to KM. Therefore, the method of alternating projection converges. Now, let me show you the, a, geo, a proof outline, the outline of the geometric proof that establishes uh, this result. So in order to get the SRG of uh, the composition of two uh, um, average operators, we take uh, this circle and then we pick a point on uh, uh, this uh, circle and then we connect it to the origin and we draw uh, the circle, uh, the circle starting at touching this point and touching the origin, the circle that takes uh, this line segment as its diameter. So we take this circle, this circle, um, this circle, and then we take the union. And then, but, it, but directly looking at the union of these circles is a little bit uh, difficult, daunting to do at first. So what we do is we analyze the uh, union in the inverted space. So we apply the inversion mapping. This circle, um, this circle gets mapped to this half plane this circle gets mapped to this half plane, and this circle gets mapped to this half plane. So now, when we act to analyze the union of these circles, we uh, can um, um, dually analyze the, uh, the union of these half planes. And uh, you can actually, it turns out that the union of these half spaces, they form a, or the boundary of it forms a parabola. So, uh, this is the vertex, this is the focus of the parabola, this is the directrix of the parabola, um, and these are some, some sort of notation uh, sign, uh, indicating the, the exact precise geometry of, these, of, of this parabola. But the point is we can get the parabola and its uh, formula comes out as x equals one minus y squared over four. Okay, so we, uh, we have this parabola um, and then we find the largest circle inscribed with it to, uh, to the left of the parabola, and then we invert. So this is the largest circle that has matching curvature at this point. It's, in, it's uh, towards the left of the parabola. We, cons we consider the region exterior to the circle. Then we perform the inversion and we get this. So by, and by inverting the formula, we get the precise formula of this uh, heart shape, which is the cardioid, which involved the cosine squared. And by inverting this uh, uh, circle, a, a white circle, we get uh, this region which, and this uh, one, one, minus one over three, this corresponds to the two thirds average operator. Okay, okay finally, finally uh, let me conclude. So the SRG maps the action of an operator to the two dimensional plane. And it's really nice because algebraic operations on, uh, on the operators correspond to geometric operations on the SRG. And using the SRG, we are able to analyze fixed point iterations, we are able to establish convergence of uh, certain fixed point iterations using geometric proofs rather than the usual analytic approach. And also, I didn't have the time to cover this today, but um, the SRG has also been used to establish convergence of a, a deep learning based uh, machine learning type uh, plug and play method that's used for uh, image denoising. Um, um, and, and finally, uh, here are some references relating to this work. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ernest, for a, a yeah, very nice talk. Um, so we have some time for questions. Uh, if you have a question, you can just unmute yourself and ask. But OK, so perhaps while people are thinking about that, I, I'll just ask one question first of all. So I want to go back to sort of the, before you started talking about um, classes of operators. So when you were just looking at the SIG of a single operator, um, you don't necessarily have to go back to the slides, but the, my question is going to be related to that. Yeah, right. right. So um, one of the things that you often want to look at when you say have two functions and you want to sub differentiate them is you want a, a sum rule so that the sub differentials of the sum is the sum of the sub differentials or for monotone operators, it would be maximality of the sum of monotone operators, right? Right. So uh, I'm wondering, does um, does the sum rule have an interpretation in terms of the scale of relative graphs? Can you easily say, you know, usually you have a constraint qualification, but is it possible to give some kind of 
condition in terms of the, the SRGs? That's an, that's an interesting question. Um, <clears throat> um, so the, the definitions of the SRG is, is, made, is deliberately made to avoid the notion of maximality because I felt like uh, those are um, the, the issues that the SRG wants to analyze are orthogonal to the notion, to the issues of maximality. So um, maybe that means there, uh, maybe that means the sum rule is, doesn't have a corresponding geometric interpretation, but I haven't thought about that. So I, 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 don't know. So the the, cor the corresponding issue, the, the corresponding form of this in the operator uh, level would be, uh, I, th I think you said it, but uh, the sum of two maximal monotone operators is not always maximal monotone. Um, I, I think the answer is um, the SRG as is uh, doesn't capture that phenomenon that uh, the, the del that delicate phenomenon, but um, I wouldn't rule out and say the uh, the ideas are completely unrelated. They they might be. I I would have to think about that a bit more. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Mm -hmm. Well answered. Um, any other questions from? Yes, I I have uh, another question. So, uh, uh, you you saw that you you can use um. At RG notion to prove um, average net of several operator, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, can can we apply the same technique to uh, to prove the average net of uh, some more complicated operator? Let's say uh, three operator, three mm -hmm. uh, of, of uh, David and 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 uh, mm -hmm. Right. So um, so. The uh, the answer is um, so no at least not that I, I not not yet so for the Davis I, I see the, the proof in, in in the in the paper of the of, of, of Damek and and Gutau is is the delicate right? <laughs> yeah so yeah so so that proof is is not that easy to follow so um, what we were able to show is that the uh, the SRG or um, um, okay, the SRG of um, uh, Davis and uh, Wu Tao Yin uh, is equal to. So we 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 do precisely characterize the SRG, um, where, and this is just equal to the uh, SRG of of averaged operators. So. Uh, in one of the references that I listed at the end, uh, we do precisely characterize what the SRG is. But in, in that work, what we do is the proof of averageness that we just we just cite that, and then uh, the but the point of that paper is that um, we establish that by showing that the SRG looks exactly like this, it's not it's actually not possible to find a better proof than what Damick Davis and Wotel Yin has presented. So. The, the, proof, the proof of convergence, uh, the proof of averageness comes with an averageness coefficient, and uh, you would want the averageness coefficient to be smaller if possible, because that would lead to a better constant in the one over k convergence rate. So we were able to use, through geometric arguments, show that uh, their proof is tight. But, but we, were, we were not able to find a fully geometric proof that replaces their proof. Oh, okay, okay. But at, at least you can show that is, you we we cannot go further. That we can we cannot have time. Yeah. Right, right. So so their proof is so their proof could be clean. It could be made more uh, uh, easier to read. So it could be improved in that way. But the conclusion of the uh, of the of the proof of the result, the conclusion, the result itself is uh, is is the best you could show. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Vera, looks like you have a question there. Yeah. Is uh, Vera? We don't hear Vera. It seems like her, your, your, your mic is, uh, it says it's unmuted, but we can't hear you. Yeah. That's odd because we, we were conversing before the, the start of the seminar, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, sure. Yes, yes.
So, uh, um, okay. You get any intuition from these graphs? Remember? So, uh, which counter examples are you referring to? Oh, the behavior of non-expansive maps um, at infinity. So it, I, I think you're referring to the um, um, the the journal of fixed point theory paper th that that I wrote. Um, can can you not if, if that's the paper that I? Uh, okay, we, we, I, I can't hear you, but. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, uh, let's see. So, um, so, so to give the other audience some background, um, there was, I, there was a counter example that I constructed and, and published regarding, um, the behavior of, of, um, of a fixed point iteration with an operator that doesn't have a fixed point and what happens, uh, when the iterates sort of diverges away to infinity. And, um, the question is, does these uh, SRGs provide insight into those examples? Um, so, um, so the answer is, I think, the, uh, so the SRG, the definition, okay, so let me put it this way. If you draw the SRG of those, uh, the weird operators without a fixed point, um, Okay, sorry, let me go to the definition of the SRG. So the SRG is a, the definition of an SRG is a global definition in the sense that it, it, it considers the, it, try to, it tries to summarize the action of the operator for all inputs. There's no restriction on what inputs X and Y we can consider. But in that counter example, um, the counter example doesn't have a fixed point and further, which can be, if you look at the SRG, uh, whether the point one is included or not it tells us whether you have a fixed point or not. So that uh, by looking at that single point, you can that that gives you that information. But otherwise, I would imagine that the SRG of that operator is not very informative because it's tr plotting the global information. But um, this this I, this direction is not pursued in uh, in th this paper or any of the pub any of my published papers on the SRG. But you could change the notion of the SRG so that it's, it's non-global. So maybe you could look at the action of the SRG um, within, let's say, a, 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 within a neighborhood, within a solution, if you have one, or you could look at the a SRG uh, that excludes, let's say, a, a large vol uh, so that you would want to look at the, the action of the operator far, far away from the origin. If you do something like that, then I think you would be, it would be possible to um, get some insight as to into those uh, into those operators um, that that uh, that uh, for, for which the fixed point iteration diverges to infinity because we're trying to understand what what the the the, the, the action of the operator at points far away from the origin. So by appropriately modifying the definition of the SRG, I think you could do that. But the, the but this with this global definition, no. But with uh, with a little bit more work, I think we can. Okay. Thank, thank you for the question. Uh, okay, so maybe we have time for uh, one more question. If okay, then if not, then thank you again, Ernest. And um, yeah, I hope everybody thank enjoys your break. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for for listening to my talk. Yeah. And thank you, Matt, for for the opportunity to speak. Okay, thank you for your nice talk.